and open the door. Alicia, are you going to? Hi, everyone. Welcome to the SCORE Soccer Summit. We're going to get started in a couple moments. Just let everyone into the room. Thank you for being here today. Please put where you're from in the chat box. We'd love to see who is zooming in to this session. We've got folks from all over the country. Right. Oh, Seattle's already here. And Ontario, nice. Countries. Countries, yes. Okay. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and welcome everybody. My name is Angela Bailey uh, from the America Scores Bay Area affiliate. We are all about creating community at America Scores Bay Area. It's why we put on the, so the Scores Soccer Summit. And so welcome and thank you for attending. Very quickly, I want to share a poem with from one of our poet athletes because at America Scores, what we hope to do is to help urban youth lead healthy lives, be engaged student, students, and have the confidence and character to make a difference in this world, just like all the speakers of the summit are doing, um, just by showing up, learning, like sharing their information and inspiring all of us. So thank you to our speakers. Thank you to America Scores Bay Area. Thank you to Alicia Yano for putting this whole summit together. And thank you also to Goal 5, and to women in soccer, building a network of women in soccer community. So become a member, check them out. And I am going to share a poem from one of our young poet athletes named Isabel, who goes to Moscone Elementary in San Francisco, and she's in the fourth grade. Her poem is titled, Athletes Paradise. Soft grass and a single ball sway in the wind while parents shout and cheer to their daughters and sons. Itchy shin guards and long socks move as if cheering me on. As the cool water responds to my body, the sweat drip kisses my temples and whispers a sweet champion song to my ears. Pen and markers dance with the paper to appreciate our fellow players. Friday's hot sun brings blue skies and loud laughter. Rainbow shirts and alligator shoes fill the fields. Friday soccer is where you'll find an athlete's paradise. I think we can all relate to that. Thank you, Isabel. Alicia, take it away. Thank you, Angela. I am very honored that um, Cassie has come back. Casey. Yeah. Cassie, I did it right first. I'm sorry, having a weird day. Um, Gray um, is back with us. She was one of our first uh, speakers in April, and we want her back every single time. She's awesome. Um, she played on the U18 national team and played D1 with Cal Berkeley, my alma mater, so yay, go Bears. Um, and she founded her the female, female football, and I am going to let her take it from here. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you so much for having me again. This is um, really, it's a joy to be here and get to talk to everybody. I appreciate everyone who's listening in from wherever you are. I'm going to share my screen really quickly and just kind of um, introduce you to female footballers and what we do and just kind of our philosophy and, and talk about the female mindset, especially right now during COVID times, which this is hard for all of our female athletes. Um, so a little bit about me. Oh, not letting me slide. Hang on a second. There we go. Um, a little bit about me. Like Alicia said, I grew up uh, here in the Bay Area. I live in San Jose. Um, played through the ODP process to the youth national team level, played D1 at Berkeley, and I got my BA in education and psychology. Uh, when I finished, I went and got my teaching credential, and I've been an elementary school teacher for the past 13 years, part-time. I have a lot of other part-time jobs um, and involved in a lot of other things, but I founded Female Footballers in 2014. Um, tell you a little bit about what we do. Um, female footballers, it, like I said, started in 2014. Um, I graduated from Cal in 2004 and the WUSA or the WUSA had just stopped and I didn't really have an opportunity to play professionally. 
And so I kind of moved on and went and got my teaching credential and I followed um, with my now husband into his career in the MLS for a while, went away from the female game. Um, by the time the WPS started, I was already in a different career and ready to have kids. And, um, but around 2013, I had my daughter and I had that moment of, you know, what is this landscape gonna look like for my daughter? And I started to do my research and look into coaching. And I realized that, that the women's world of coaching and, and female soccer had not changed as much as I'd hoped it had, especially being a teenager in the 99 World Cup and just seeing you know, how there was a lot of momentum and growth. So I was really kind of bummed to see that there were still a lot of the same issues. So I started writing and, and writing for days. My husband kind of looked at it and he's like, I think you have something here. And so we started as an um, organization to give back uh, to girls that were like us. And so we're an all female led organization. There's eight of us. Um, we believe in empowering and educating female athletes through mental skills or what we call mindset skills. And those are kind of all the, the non tangible things you learn from sports um, that are vital to getting to the highest levels, but also that propel you into the world after sports and help you be successful. Um, and so we believe in this whole player approach, which I'm gonna talk about a lot, but part of the reason I started this was being a teacher and an educator, um, it's just like being a coach, except I find there's sometimes this one difference that I'd like to see more in coaching. And that would be as a teacher, I'm expected to um, know my content and the standards that I teach, but I'm also expected to know the developmental age that I teach. So if I go to eighth grade, I need to know what the eighth graders social emotional world is like, as well as the content that I'm teaching them. And then I have to drop back down to second grade and know that. And I think in the coaching world, you know, we're often expected to know our expertise with our technical, our tactical, our physical side. But a lot of the time we're not held accountable for the mental side of who we're training and, and the types of kids that we come into contact with and what they're going through in the develop, developmental age um, that we're coaching. And we should know more about that side of the game and stress it more in our, in our game. So, um, so that's why this whole, whole body mentality is important, this whole player side to it. That means that we, we talk about the body, which would be the physical, the agility, the strength, the fitness, the craft, which is your technical, tactical sides of the game, but then the mindset, which are what we're talking about, these mental skills. Um, and we notice that, you know, I get the question a lot, why do female athletes need to focus uh, more in particular? How come just it's not for everybody? And my, my answer often is it is for everybody. This whole player approach should absolutely be for everybody. Um, but there is, there are some stats, some alarming stats that show that females could really benefit from a little bit more focus on this mindset side, this mental skill portion. So we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Um, first and foremost, girls are motivated a little bit differently than boys on paper on these stats. That's not to say all girls are motivated this way. Um, but Primarily more girls are motivated by, you know, spending time with friends, the camaraderie piece, the team aspect. Um, that doesn't mean they're not motivated by competition and winning and all the same things as boys, but higher levels find that connection piece really valuable and important. Um, and with that comes mental skills that need to go along with, um, with these relationships. Um, another alarming stat would be that, you know, girls ages seven to 13, if we can get them in the sport that young and keep them in the sport, they might find some more longevity in the sport. But we do see a huge decline in the girls side of the game between 12 and 13, when they're hitting eighth grade to freshman year high school, big dropouts at that age. Um, and so part of why we're doing what we're doing is to make sure that we retain girls in the sport, even if they're not gonna see the collegiate game, just so that, um, they can have a fulfilling part of their life be with soccer and it's not this negative thing going into their teens. And then lastly, girls have a lot of exterior pressure on them. 30% um, of high school girls have this pressure to be perfect. I would argue that that stat is a lot higher than 30%, especially in COVID times. Uh, the notion of perfection on girls is something that is different uh, for genders. So those are just a few reasons why we tend to be um, focusing on the female aspect of this. Um, but now we're seeing even more concerning stats in COVID times. Um, the mental well-being of our players we know has been a challenge the past eight months or so. 
And so what we want to talk about today is more how to help you as a coach or a parent navigate this mental side through sport for your daughter or your players. Um, so some of these stats are not surprising, but definitely alarming. 50, out of 1,500 teenagers, seven out of 10 reported, you know, an effect on their mental health. 50% are struggling with anxiety, 43% um, with depression, and 45 with just more stress than usual. That's at the teenage level. Um, unfortunately, all of our stats are teenage and higher, but we know with elementary students and middle school students, it's also uh, an alarming um, stat. Um, four and five athletes that were recently surveyed through the NCAA um, are talking about having a lack of access to training facilities so that they can put some time into the, the craft and the body side of the game. And 40% are experiencing a lack of motivation, um, realizing that once games were taken out of the equation, you know, what's the point of the sport? Finding joy in the other sides of it has been really hard for players. It's no surprise there. Um, but probably the most alarming is just these feelings of hopelessness. 259% is up during the COVID pandemic. That's super alarming. And so if in our organization, we already felt that mindset skills are pertinent to having a female athlete find success, but now it's even more crucial, especially during COVID times, for us to put some time and energy into this side of the game. Um, loved this quote. I'm not going to read it to you, but you know, a lot of the times we we coach the player in their physical being. We coach their technical skills that we can see. We show them game footage on the tactical side. We're running them and, and helping them lift and working on those physical attributes. All those things are things you can see. The mental skills are, are not tangible. They're, they're a bit invisible and it's hard to navigate, but that doesn't mean that it's out of sight, out of mind. It means that we need to put the time and effort into it as coaches and as parents. Um, so again, just to wrap up that mindset matters um, and it is a game changer. And we saw this morning, if you watched any of these other talks today with Daniel Slayton and Cindy Carlo Cohn, they talked about the, the aspect of the mental side of the game and how at the national team level, they're sports psychologists. Now, I'm not a sports psychologist and nobody on our staff is a sports psychologist. That doesn't mean we don't know what we're talking about. We have been there, we have done it, and we are here to provide the connection and the relationship for these girls and give back what we know and how we can help as educators and as women that have been through this. And um, that mental edge, that mental side, the toughness, all of that is what propels you when you get to the highest levels, everyone's on the same playing field technically, tactically, physically. That mental side is what really sets you apart. Um, and so as coaches or parents, if you're a parent or a coach listening today, um, how do we help strengthen the mindset of players? And especially right now in COVID times, I think there's been a lot of coaches who are a bit lost. And right now in the past eight months, we've seen a lot of clubs hyper focus on the technical because that's something we can control and we're pushing our players in their backyards to juggle and do all these different technical skill work which is not a bad thing or we're asking them to watch game footage and analyze their play and again not a bad thing same with physical extra fitness and agility work and strength training again not bad but how many of you can honestly say that you've put a ton of effort and time into the mental side? And I'd be willing to, to bet that there are a lot of you thinking, yeah, I could probably put a little bit more time into that. So that's what we're here for today is to give you some tips. So the next few slides are gonna kind of give you a little roadmap as to how you can help. And there's actually some tangible activities we want to give you that you can try out with your teams or as a parent, you can bring back to your team. So the first one is, um, the most simple exercise ever and it's kind of a starting point because honestly it feels like where do we start um this is a quick activity that you would think doesn't matter at all it's super simple but it's a good starting off point ask each player to list their three strengths whether you do it on an index card at training or you have them email it to you or you have them fill it out in a zoom and type it into the chat it doesn't matter you can do it anyway depending on where your county is with all this covid stuff um and you, a lot of coaches have done this and they're like, yeah, easy, I've done that. But a lot of coaches don't take this to the level it needs to be taken to. It's a simple activity, sure. But what you get from it and how you analyze what you get and what you do next is the most important part, right? It's our response to these types of exercises that matters the most. 
So as a coach, you need to ask yourself, all right, well, when I have all my players do this, how many of them actually wrote down strengths that were technical? Because a lot of girls, especially right now with how much focus there's been on these technical skills, they're writing that stuff down. Uh, same with physical, it's tangible. Same with tactical a lot of the time. You know, they are aware that they are, you know, they make the right run down the line or they're aware of your pressure cover balance, whatever it is. But very few players will write down a mental strength. And one, that's probably because we're women. And as women and girls, we struggle very much to talk about the things we're good at, especially if the culture of your team or program is not a safe space for players to be that vulnerable. And two, it's also, it's harder to, to, to see, you know, it's not tangible. So it's really hard to know if you feel like you're good at it, doesn't mean you're good at it. You know, girls second guess a lot of that. So like I just mentioned, most girls, they are able to pinpoint the technical, tactical, physical, but very few times players will write down their mental strength. We've done this with a lot of different groups and a lot of groups struggle to write down. They don't ever say like, I'm confident, encourager, and, and they don't write those things down. So first, have them do it, see what they write and pay attention to that because that's gonna tell you a lot about your players. If, if they struggle to write down strengths at all, that says a lot about where they're at mentally. If they write down all technical, that's great. But again, when we're looking at the whole player approach, that's only one avenue to this. And if we are looking for players to be um, you know, savvy in, in all these different aspects, then we need to make sure they're a priority in our programs and on our teams. Um, so once you start off and you have this activity, the next thing you're going to want to do is, um, is kind of start, find a roadmap for where you're going to go with it. Um, in COVID times, we want to make sure that we're hitting some of those areas where we mentioned in the statistics that are kind of the most alarming. Um, when there's pressure to be perfect, when there's high anxiety and lack of motivation, um, when there's depression, we chose these three avenues as the direction to take your program or your team into in 2021. So coming back from the holidays in December, you know, starting to put an emphasis with your teams or your programs on motivation, confidence, and self-care. Um, I'm going to give you uh, reasons why these three are most important and an activity for each one of these that you can take with you. If you feel like you, you know, I don't want to reinvent the wheel, stay on this because we've already created a curriculum for all of these. And it's something that you can um, find on our website later. And I'll give you all that information at the end. Let's see. So starting with motivation for coaches, um, what does that mean? That means that, again, if we're going back to that notion that coaches are like teachers and teachers are like coaches, all of us have standards and a style that we like, right? As a coach, I have standards I want to hold my team to. And I also have a style that, that is my style that I bring to the table that's different from another coach. That's great. No one's asking you to change that. However, as a coach, I believe, and at female footballers, we believe that differentiating how you motivate players promotes better connection and relationships with your players, which ultimately you're going to see success as a team with. So again, having your own standards and style is fine, but figuring out how each player is motivated and teaching them to have that autonomy and the ownership over their motivation style is really important. Um, how do we do that? Well, a lot of it stems from activities that you can put into your practices on the field or off the field, but you have to have the willingness to look at the whole player approach. You have to emphasize that the mindset matters. And if you do, you know, knowing that not everybody is gonna wanna be screamed at. If you, if you scream at a player, that might work for half your team, which it does. Many female athletes are absolutely motivated by a yelling mentality or, you know, um, I'm not gonna start this person and I'm gonna try to light a fire under them to, to make them realize that, that, you know, I need them. However you wanna motivate them, that's, that's fine. But realizing that, that might not work for everybody. And if it doesn't work for a player, we want the player one to be aware it doesn't work for her, to be able to vocalize that. But we also want the coach to be willing to differentiate 
how he or she motivates his or her players so that that, that um, you can get the most out of your players. Um, and then for players, if you're a player watching this or a parent, you know, making sure that your daughter or your player really understands what works for them and being able to have that autonomy. Do I, you know, do I have this internal drive and this passion? Am I, um, you know, an avid watcher of the sport, a reader of the sport, follower of the sport, or is it more, I love to play and compete and I want to win and I'm super competitive. And there's nothing wrong with both of those. And many of our players have both internal and external motivators that work for them. And COVID has really highlighted maybe the part that you're most motivated by. So if you're having a player who's really struggling to motivate right now because they miss playing in games, that tells you they really love to compete. And that's not a bad thing, but as a coach or a parent, we want to help them find what are the other reasons you play? What's your why? Why do you want to do this? And if you can't have games right now, or you can't play to the level you want to play because of COVID or any other adversities that you're facing, how can we pull the love and the excitement and the drive back out of you externally? Maybe it's music. Like Danya was saying in her presentation before this, bring music back, bring that fun, bring freestyle, bring something different to your trainings your players? Um, is it a motto um, or a quote, you know, providing some of that kind of stuff? Is it a role model or a mentor? You know, having your players connect with some of these women in the NWSL, international players um, on the women's national team, you know, wherever they can access it. Um, and then again, goal setting. Um, it's huge. Goal setting is huge. And so that brings me to the activity for motivation that you can do through players. Oftentimes as coaches, we want to um, we want to have our players set goals, but we're not consistent with it. We don't follow up and we make it way too lofty. Like, OK, great. You want to play for the women's national team. Awesome. Every little girl probably wants to play at that highest level. However, how are we going to get there? We got to start small. We have to set SMART goals. SMART stands for specific, measurable, achievable, relevant and timely. And what that means is they're just really detailed and you've got to start small, do short-term goals and a long-term goal, do goals for your technical ability, do a goal for a tactical, for your physical and for your mental. Don't just pick one, have them pick all, maybe not all at the same sitting or at the same time, um, but then consistently review session every month where they bring out a notebook with their goals in it and they revise them, have them stick it up next to their bed and make it a priority that they see them on a regular basis and that they also realize that goals are fluid. They're not something that we have to keep exactly. We can change them and, and mix them up a little bit and that's okay, that's not a bad thing. So that's kind of one aspect of what you can do during COVID is focusing on motivation since that's an area we're really seeing players struggle with. The second is confidence. And honestly, confidence is this huge umbrella term and it means a lot of things. So one, keep that in mind. It's an umbrella term with a lot of different terms underneath it, like self-esteem, like growth mindset. There's a lot of things under the umbrella of confidence. However, as a coach, the number one thing I would suggest that you start to um, gather into your world uh, and into your team and program is confidence is a habit. It is not a trait. Don't look at your players as, oh, she's confident and she's not, because you're putting them into these boxes that aren't fair. Confidence needs daily practice. It, it needs to have, if it's a habit, it might just be that your player is cultivating a bad habit of how they're trying to find that confidence. Or some players are better at, at practicing that, that habit often. And so as a coach, it's finding ways to create positive habits on your team. Um, and players, that's something that's on you. It's not just your coach's job for you to practice that as a habit. If you don't know what I mean by practicing, a huge part of how we practice our, um, ourselves having more confidence is, is positive self-talk. As women and girls, we could hear a positive statement and a negative statement, and we can automatically go to the negative and ruminate over it. Ruminate meaning circulate, it just circles back to the negative thought. And with some girls, that is a motivator, back to motivation. Some girls, that helps fuel the fire for them. Other girls, it doesn't. Realizing that every player is gonna be motivated differently. And so what you say, how you say it, and what you say to yourself matters hugely in how 
you're going to respond in times of adversity like COVID. So positive self-talk. As a coach and a player, that means you have to focus on the process and progress and effort, not perfection. That word perfect drives me nuts. And I remember when I played ODP, I think it was the state team, California, NorCal, um, my coach always said, um, what do you say? Um, I think it was process over perfection. He always said that. And it was, it, it was nice to hear that. It was the first time I'd ever heard that, that it didn't have to be perfect. And like we said, when 30% of girls are feeling that pressure to be perfect, using that word can be detrimental for some girls. So focusing on the effort, the process, the progress is going to help have your girls find a little bit more confidence. And again, visualization and positive imagery, any way that you can influence yourself with those things, but also as coaches that you can put that into your program as well. So one activity um, that you can do, let me see here, is uh, super simple. Again, have your players write down three to five negative thoughts. Uh, the things they think about the most that, or, or the things they find the worst about their game. Um, maybe it's just, I'm not good at passing. I can't juggle. And we really want to teach them that these thoughts are, are you ruminating over them? Teach them what that word means and explain that as women, that's something that is very common. It doesn't mean that you're a bad person if you do it, but it's become a bad habit and we need to fix bad habits and that that's doable. That's, it's not that you were born with confidence or not. It's that we've created some bad habits we need to fix or we need to strengthen the, the great habits you already have. So switching from negative statements to positive, it's not as hard as it looks, but the hardest part of it is being consistent with it. Meaning that if a player writes down, um, they say, I'm sorry a lot, for example, I was that player. Sometimes I still am that player when I play indoor with my friends. Um, when you apologize, it's a negative statement. Ultimately, you're apologizing for something you did that you don't feel was good. Um, you have to be consistent about correcting yourself. And so first we write them down, we switch them to positives, and then we've got to memorize those positive statements to the point where they become what we ruminate over. Um, so using positive self-talk and spending time on this as a coach or a player is huge if you want to increase your level of confidence. And then our last area during COVID that we think is really important to focus on is self-care. We're seeing, like it said, um, huge percentage increases in hopelessness, in depression and anxiety. And the biggest thing, I know Danielle mentioned this in their talk this morning with Cindy, uh, Cindy Parlo Cohn too, is controlling your controllables. Um, there is so much out of control for players right now. And it's not just in the soccer world. When we think about coaching our players at their developmental age and dealing with teenagers or 10 year olds or whatever age you're coaching collegiately, think about their external world outside of the sport and those pressures because those pressures become issues they ruminate while they're practicing. They're things that they're not gonna go away and they are hard, things are hard right now. So as much as you can instill balance and add fun right now, the more important that's gonna be. If that means that you take a session off from social distance, uh, technical skill work in their boxes, and you bring out some paper and pencils and you do one of these types of activities, just the change of doing something different like that can really inspire players. It can make them pep up and be like, oh, what are we doing? It changes the conversation, which is important right now, because if we're always focusing on one aspect and we're you know, we're beating it into the ground, you're going to lose the motivation, you're going to lose the confidence um, and the drive for some of your players. So how do we add that fun? How do we make it so that they focus on what they can control? You add in self-care, you add in that life isn't just about your sport, that other things matter too, and that balance matters within what you're doing. Um, so as a team, an activity you could do individually or as a team is create a self-care menu. Uh, we have a lot of self-care activities at female footballers. Um, one of my favorites is control the controllables. I'm not sharing that one with you today because this one's kind of more broad and, and something that's easier to set up right away, but creating a, a self-care menu with your team, do it together, whether it's Zoom or in training sessions, write down, bring a chart paper or a whiteboard, whatever it is, and write down what the players want to do. Say, okay, five minute things. What do you do to 
recenter yourself, bring yourself back, try to find that balance. Is it breathing? Is it texting your friend? Is it listening to a song? Is it, um, you know, finding your quote and reading it that you love? Is it a stretch? Um, have them create that list, 15 minute ones, 30 minute ones, one to two hour ones. You can make this an individual activity and it would still be great. But as a team, what I love about it is it also brings up the conversation of what the girls do outside of soccer and knowing that you knowing what your teammate does outside of the sport is really cool because that will cultivate exterior relationships outside of the games and, and, and cultivate friendships and it'll ultimately bring your players together, which is a huge goal. Um, but I would revisit this every month. And especially while we're still in COVID, you could revisit this daily, weekly, monthly. We have no idea how long we're gonna be in this. Um, hopefully sooner will end than later, but self-care is huge. And this is just one way that you can start focusing on um, having your players realize that there is, there is life outside of this. Um, one thing that we think you could add to this too would be um, cultivating a list of um, maybe books or avenues to research and learn about that your, your players are interested in after soccer or in college or a class they might want to take the next year in school when we get back together. Those types of things also connect life after sport and they connect that self-care matters outside of soccer because ultimately all of these aspects that we're talking about, these mental skills, the whole reason that we value them is we learn them through sport, but they take us way beyond and they, they are in our everyday lives, in our business worlds, in our worlds as parents and, and all sorts of stuff. So it's really cool. So those are some activities and focuses, but if you're kind of still like, well, what more can I do? Honestly, the biggest thing I feel like and at Female Footballers, we feel like is just provide connection. Our players need connection. You know, like we mentioned, the big, huge reason girls play soccer is relationships and team and camaraderie. They need that right now. And I know that's hard to do on a soccer field, but that doesn't mean that you can't get creative and find ways to provide that connection amongst your, your players. As parents, same thing. If you're kind of like, this feels like a lot, I can't reinvent the wheel, I don't have time for all this, or as a coach, you know, my program or my DOC or whatever, don't, they don't kind of believe in the whole player approach or it's not something that that is focused on, then come check us out. We are a program that that's what we do. We provide we actually even provide that connection for your players. We provide mentors that are current or former professional players. So the picture you're looking at, those are our current mentors right now. Some are currently playing professional soccer like Haley Lucas and uh, she plays for EAG in France. We have Kelly Fitzgerald who's recently been playing in Denmark. We have Louise Arsenault who plays um, for the NorCal Beach Women's team. We have so many amazing current players and then we have a lot of former players that have played at the highest levels, whether it's professional or collegiate. And we're here to make a difference for your girls right now and all the time. Um, our online options that we offer, we offer clubs and coaches and DOCs a team curriculum. So you could come and you can check out a whole curriculum on motivation, a whole curriculum on confidence or self-care right now. We have a lot more modules we're gonna continue to create, but this is all stuff that we've done during COVID. Um, we also have, if, if you're more like a parent, you're looking for your daughter to have something more individual, we also have courses on these. So you can have the whole motivation course, you can take the confidence course, the self-care course, and you're actually paired with one of those players you just saw in the pictures who will take the course with you. They will video message you. You can Zoom with them and actually have that connection, even if it's virtually. Um, and then starting in January, we're gonna start doing workshop webinars, much like this, where we've got more of a panel situation, a conversation with our professional and current former players um, about these mental skills. And our January one is gonna be a, a pro panel um, for parents on the importance of role models. So that'll be coming up um, in January. And ultimately, I just wanna leave you with our motto, which for me is um, one of the most important aspects to why we do this. Um, you can't be what you can't see. And I wanna explain this in detail. Um, you can't be what you can't see doesn't mean you have to be a female to provide what we're doing. It means that 
as a woman and as women and girls in soccer, we need representation. We need more coaches. We need more women that look like us and we need to hear from them. That doesn't mean that if you're a male coach, you can't provide what we're talking about. You're an ally, we need you. Um, but if you're a male coach, it's not a bad thing either to find ways to provide women for your players that they can aspire to be, whether it's a book you have them read or a podcast you have them listen to, um, or being an ally in Women in Soccer, which is an awesome new organization that everyone should join. Um, but you can't be what you can't see it just means that we need representation. And our organization is a bunch of women who we might not coach a team daily, but we have been there. We know what it's like to be a player at all different levels. And we are here to support our younger generations. And we can't keep waiting for players to hit these mental skills training sessions at the collegiate or the national team levels. We have to start infiltrating the youth sports because if we're gonna expect our players to compete against each other at eight years old in comp for a starting position, then we need to give them tools and experiences and knowledge and education as to you know, how to do this in a way that's going to benefit them and their team. Um, and so you can't be what you can't see is just a motto to explain that we are all female led because we need to represent for our girls. And this last picture is, is just some of the inspiring stories we've heard just in the last month. This is just the last month. And I think what's really cool is as we have more representation and women who are willing to give back in the sport to provide the skills that we're talking about, the more we're gonna see this wave start to occur that we've already seen between some of these women in this picture. You know, they might be the first in their, in their avenues to, um, to start to the conversation about the empowerment that we can have and, uh, and all of that, but they're not gonna be the last. And I heard Cindy Parlow come say that this morning as she's the first uh, you know, female president of US soccer, we know she's not gonna be the last. And um, if you check out US soccer, the Jill Ellis um, education program is awesome. Her mentorship program, check that out as well. Um, they're doing a lot of great things, but we're starting to see this momentum occur since the 2019 World Cup and we wanna keep it going. And ways to do that is just finding avenues for your girls to see themselves in those roles. And that's kind of our whole point of what we do. So um, thank you for letting me uh, share this. I'll, I'll stop sharing real quick. Um, but I just wanted to um, let you all know, oh, you know what? I had one more slide, I'm sorry. Let me go back to that real quick. <laughs> sorry, my last slide here. I, I just saw some of the comments saying, how can we find uh, info? Let me show you that last slide. Um, so you can find us on our website, which um, we, we have two sites. We have femalefootballers.org, which will take you to everything. And that's kind of everything we do because we, we do offer camps and clinics where we come in and we do the mindset activities on the field, as well as technical tactical skills. Um, but we also, we offer the parent ed and recently we've pivoted during COVID to offer the, a lot of the online programs. So this teachable site that you can see is our coursework. So we've got our curriculum for teach, uh, coaches and DOCs and then we have our courses for individual girls. And you should definitely sign up and check them out because we just piloted this entire program with the OL Rain Academy with Amy Griffin. And it's been really cool to get feedback from them and see girls at this highest level in the GA start to use what we're doing and, and find value in it. Uh, but we're also on all the different social media avenues. We recently added a TikTok, thanks to the younger girls on our staff. Uh, Rachel Mercer will give you a shout out for that. Um, but you know, there's, there's a lot of places you can find us. We're trying to be loud about what we're doing just because we truly believe in it. We're really passionate. This is a, a passion project that's turning into a a, a bigger business. So we're excited. So that's it. Now I'll stop sharing. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you so much, Cassie. Yeah. Um, that was fabulous. Um, we do have some questions. Awesome. And well, um, the biggest one is a lot of people want to know, um, can they get a copy of your PowerPoint? Um, um, if they signed up to have the replay, right? They'll get to see it all, right? Yeah, or if, if you want to email it to me, I can make sure everyone who's here gets a yeah, copy yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah happy to. All right. 
Um, okay, here's a couple questions for you. Yeah. At what age do you think is a good age um, to for girls to start in the game, both physically and mentally? Um, I think, you know, whenever a girl wants to, um, I started soccer at four and I did it because I had an older sister who was super into it and I loved it immediately, but I also played other sports all the way up until ninth grade. I played softball, field hockey. Um, I ran track. I did a lot of other sports, but I have a daughter, she's seven and, um, I struggle with that as a parent too. I had her in, you know, the young kids love soccer type programs and she loved it, but it's hard. I don't want to push her too hard, especially because me and my husband are kind of a soccer couple in a way. And um, I do feel like we are putting a lot of pressure on girls at a young age uh, with comp getting as intense as it is now, starting at age six. I do think developmentally, girls are not ready for some of the social emotional situations we're putting them in. So I think it's as a parent knowing that you're stepping into that world, finding a club that really uh, matches the values that you feel are important for your child is the most important part. If, if a club is too intense, find a different club. If a club isn't intense enough, again, find a different club. You just have to find what works for your own philosophy. My Great. own is just finding what's developmentally appropriate for, for my daughter. Great. This question is from Debbie. Um, do you find it more difficult for players to continue their sport online after being online all day for school? And what can we do about that? Yeah, I definitely do. I think, um, so being a teacher, I work twice a week and I'm on Zoom all day on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And um, the other days I'm with my own kids teaching them. So I'm seeing the, the same thing all of you as parents and coaches are seeing. They're Zoomed out. There's a serious thing to Zoom fatigue. I feel it, I would see it with my kids. Um, as a coach, I think that's where this connection piece is huge. You know, when you meet up as a coach and you're you're just running through drills again or you have them in their boxes because they have to socially distant and they can't actually compete. This is where, you know, infiltrating your practices with some of these types of activities in person can be really strong. It can create that connection, the camaraderie in person without even touching. There's so many different activities you can do that are paper, pencil, that are um, just conversations to have in person. So even if your, um, your third practice that week is supposed to be a Zoom, if you can figure out a way to meet at a park socially distance and just have the conversation instead, I would do that over another Zoom where you're going to you know, ask them to do a PowerPoint on their favorite player. Although in the beginning of, of this whole situation, that was a cool way to do things. Now they're Zoomed out. So doing that more in person or having the conversation or having the homework of, hey, watch this podcast or this movie, and then let's talk about it in person at our next practice, that's probably more valuable. Okay, um, and this is a, another question. Have you ever had a situation where you have two players that are not getting along on a team and it's disrupting the flow of the team and, and what can you do about that so everyone's mental health stays healthy? Well, first of all, I think that, that that's a notion to something is off with the culture of the team and it's up to a coach to set that culture. Um, what I mean by that is um, setting a space up on your team where girls feel safe to be vulnerable, to um, express themselves without judgment, that's on a coach. And um, I've worked with Girls Leadership for the past two years, which is a great nonprofit in Oakland. And our whole goal is, is teaching girls conflict resolution in a safe space. So the number one thing that as a coach you can do is create that safe space. As a parent, yes, it's having conversations with the coach and your, and your daughter. Personally, I think empowering your daughter, depending on the ages of these players, is number one. I see that in teaching. I would much rather have a parent come talk to me than go to my principal. I would much rather have uh, a student come to me rather than a parent. You know, whoever it's affecting, that person needs to be able to communicate about it. So if these girls are 18 years old and a parent's getting involved, I don't want to see that. I want to see the 18 year old communicating to the coach. Um, but again, maybe that 18 year old's in a situation where the culture isn't safe, then that's a conversation as a whole group of parents and players and a coach. They need to sit down and have a talk about, do we feel like this is the right 
culture that we want to cultivate. And in COVID times, this is a great time to work on that, you know? I don't know if I answered that exactly. I think you did, but we're going to give you a little bit more. Um, Michelle has a daughter who's dealing with some um, kind of bullying on the team. Her daughter's a goalie and they have someone already on the team that's a goalie and the male coach seems oblivious to what's going on. What advice do you have to give her for her daughter to stay focused and not, and to deal with the bullying? So first of all, I wanna make sure that parents know there's a difference between relational aggression and bullying. And I love that, that Michelle, that you use the term relational aggression. Um, a lot of parents think that um, when this is happening on a team that they're being bullied. Um, relational aggression is the term that you're thinking of. It's not bullying. Bullying is repeated, um, it's repetitive, and it is um, with the intent to harm. Sometimes girls are having repeated issues and it's not having the intent to harm. So relational aggression is more that situation where um, there's conflict. And I think the hardest part about this is girls aren't given the tools uh, the words to express themselves in a way that one gets their point across, two, where they feel safe to do it. Um, a coach being a male, there's many male coaches who are super in tune with their players. So I wouldn't necessarily say it's a gender thing. I think men get a lot of uh, flack for, for not being in tune. There's a lot of male coaches who are wonderful out there who are in tune with that, but there's also that stereotype is there sometimes for a reason. And I do think there are a lot of male coaches, but in coaches in general, women too, that just don't realize that we are responsible as coaches for the emotional, social sides of coaching. That that needs, in my opinion, that needs to be in coaching education. This is the, if you go to the highest levels, they don't talk about that. And that's something that needs to be talked about. But, um, you know, I do think that empower your child to have these conversations, giving them the tools first to go to the coach is number one. Don't do it for them. We don't want to create athletes that we send to college eventually who you're still as a parent going to be involved in it. Um, I think bringing, you know, having your daughter bring it to the coach so that it's on his radar is number one. Um, making sure your daughter knows the difference between relational aggression and bullying and that her teammates do and that the coach does. Um, it's, it's just needing, you know, more education on these types of terms. Check out, if you live in the Bay Area, check, or it's not even the Bay Area, it's a national program, but check out Girls Leadership. Um, dot org. They're awesome for um, conflict resolution skills to help empower your children um, to have these types of conversations. They do great workshops right now during COVID too. Great. That's awesome. So the, the summit, we're bringing together a whole bunch of leaders, top leaders in the soccer community. And one of our last sessions is going to be bringing this all together and what can we do in the future? Um, what do you foresee and what do you envision for yourself personally in five to 10 years and how the soccer community can work together and what items can we do to make it better for both women and girls? Awesome question. Yeah. Um, so when I started female footballers, I was like super excited and idealistic about making this impact. And then I quickly realized like how hard it is as a female in this world to make this impact. You know, uh, this is a male dominated field. Uh, I've had a lot of situations where I go into doing a clinic or trying to get people interested and I, I kind of get the yeah, great like mindset. And only in the last probably year or two, people are starting to take what I'm saying seriously um, or the notion of mental health and, and the stigma around that is slowly changing. And I think that, um, one of the things that I've learned and that I hope for in the next future, you know, few years is instead of trying to change um, everybody's view on, you know, um, women in soccer and what to do, but it's more like start with your own community. And I think that the more you can in get involved in the grassroots organizations around you, that starts a movement. So um, recently, you know, I played in the justice match, the Oakland Roots and getting involved in my community um, around that. I'm a mindset mentor for our club here, South Bay FC. Um, I work with the US Soccer Development Council for the Bay Area, um, trying to add uh, raising funds for um, US soccer, but also for the female side with, you know, getting more coaches on board. And so kind of putting your foot in the door 
um, in any way you can on the community level is something that I'm interested in. And that's how I hope to grow. And this is why that women in soccer and um, even goal five is also sponsoring. Those are two organizations that, you know, they're bigger than, than just the organizations themselves. What they stand for are huge. And um, I think that I would like to be a part of all of that and, and learn from everybody around me and kind of have this slow progression of a change. You know, it's like, I don't love the pay to play model personally, but I know that's not going away. So how can I deal with that situation within it? And, and same with this, like we're not gonna tomorrow have a thousand female coaches and be completely equal in the sport, but what can I do on a individual level and a community-based level is what I'm hoping. So in five to 10 years, I'm hoping we're still doing what we're doing, but we've grown a lot and we're impacting our community and a, a larger scale soccer community. Um, and unless anybody has any other questions, there's one last question. Um, what is a way we can get away from pay to play? Do you have any ideas that I might help? <laughs> yeah. That's I a big it. one. I, my personal philosophy is just that, um, you know, I grew up in an affluent area, but I was middle class and um, I was very fortunate throughout my soccer journey to have help. You know, when I was 16, my I got offered to play in Japan and I couldn't afford it. And my parents, my best friend's dad owned a company and he sponsored me. And I was super lucky to have those opportunities. There's a lot of players that don't. And I think you know, our structures and our systems, like Danya was saying, they need to be revisited. And we need to look at, you know, I personally don't love that this is this billion dollar industry. And I think it needs to come back to why are we doing this? I think parents often lose sight as to why their kids play sports in the first place. And I get it, I'm a parent, I see, you know, you're, you're sitting on the sidelines of your kid's game and it's intense and you're competitive and I get it, but ultimately the pay to play model isn't what's best for everyone. And we're missing a lot of talent in really cool small places. And um, I think it'd be interesting. I wish we could figure out a way to have corporate sponsorships for clubs so that these big, we live in the Silicon Valley, big tech companies, sponsor clubs and, and that way we can find talent within our community that might not be trying to play because they can't afford it. So um, I don't know, that's kind of our hope for the club my kids play in, but we'll see. <laughs> well, that's a great idea. I mean, I think corporate sponsorship is awesome for all the clubs. Um, I wanna thank you so much for taking the time and giving such a wonderful presentation. Um, along with all the speakers we had today. It was a great day. Want to thank our sponsors, Women in Soccer. And Angela put the uh, URL in the chat box. It's free membership, so everybody should sign up. And then goal five, someone in today's audience is going to be the winner of a lucky product giveaway from goal five. So thank you very much to both of our um, partners. And we have lots more coming up this week. Great sessions. I think we're, tomorrow we're going to start off with Brandy Chastain and Julie Foudy. So you don't want to miss that. Um, lots and lots of good stuff coming. Um, Cassie, thank you so much. And I love female footballers. I love the mindset. And um, I can't wait to look at the slides again and uh, get some more <laughs> info for my teams. Um, so thank you so much to the audience. We could not do that without everyone's support and coming and watching. And have a good evening and please stay safe. And um, hopefully we'll see you for future sessions. Thank you so much. Thank you, I appreciate it. Bye.